This is Audible. Blackstone Audio presents A World Out of Time by Larry Niven. Chapter 1 Rammer 1. Once there was a dead man. He had been waiting for two hundred years inside a coffin, suitably labeled, whose outer shell held liquid nitrogen. There were frozen clumps of cancer all through his frozen body. He had had it bad. He was waiting for medical science to find him a cure. He waited in vain. Most varieties of cancer could be cured now, but no cure existed for the billions of cell walls ruptured by expanding crystals of ice. He had known the risk. He had gambled anyway. Why not? He'd been dying. The vaults held over a million of these frozen bodies. Why not? They'd been dying. Later there came a young criminal. His name is forgotten and his crime is secret, but it must have been a terrible one. The state wiped his personality for it. Afterward he was a dead man, still warm, still breathing, even reasonably healthy, but empty. The state had use for an empty man. Corbell woke on a hard table, aching as if he had slept too long in one position. He stared incuriously at a white ceiling. Memories floated up to him of a double-walled coffin, and sleep, and pain. The pain was gone. He sat up at once, and flapped his arms wildly for balance. Everything felt wrong. His arms would not swing right. His body was too light. His head bobbed strangely on a thin neck. He reached frantically for the nearest support, which turned out to be a blond young man in a white jumpsuit. Corbell missed his grip. His arms were shorter than he had expected. He toppled on his side, shook his head, and sat up more carefully. His arms, scrawny, knobby, and not his. The man in the jumpsuit said, Are you all right? Yeah, said Corbell. My God, what have they done to me? I thought I was ready for anything but this. He fought rising panic. His throat was rusty, but that was all right. This was certainly somebody else's body, but it didn't seem to have cancer either. What's the date? How long has it been? A quick recovery. The checker gave him a plus. 2190, your dating. You won't have to worry about our dating. That sounded ominous. Cautiously, Corbell postponed the obvious next question. What's happened to me? And asked instead, Why not? You won't be joining our society. No? What then? Several professions are open to you. A limited choice. If you don't qualify for any of them, we'll try someone else. Corbell sat on the edge of the hard operating table. His body seemed younger, more limber, definitely thinner, not very clean. He was acutely aware that his abdomen did not hurt no matter how he moved. He asked, And what happens to me? I've never learned how to answer that question. Call it a problem in metaphysics, said the checker. Let me detail what's happened to you so far, and then you can decide for yourself. There was an empty man, still breathing and as healthy as most of society in the year 2190, but empty. The electrical patterns in the brain, the worn paths of nervous reflex, the memories, the person, had all been wiped away as penalty for an unnamed crime. And there was this frozen thing. Your newspapers called you people corpsicles, said the blonde man. I never understood what the tapes meant by that. It comes from popsicle, frozen sherbet. Corbell had used the word himself before he became one of them, one of the corpsicles, the frozen dead. Frozen within a corpsicle's frozen brain were electrical patterns that could be recorded. The process would warm the brain and destroy most of the patterns, but that hardly mattered, because other things must be done, too. Personality was not all in the brain. Memory RNA was concentrated in the brain, but it ran all through the nerves and the blood. In Corbell's case, the clumps of cancer had to be cut away. Then the RNA could be leached out of what was left. The operation would have left nothing like a human being, Corbell gathered, more like bloody mush. What's been done to you is not the kind of thing that can be done twice, the checker told him. You get one chance, and this is it. 
If you don't work out, we'll terminate and try someone else. The vaults are full of corpsicles. You mean you'd wipe my personality? Corbell said unsteadily. But I haven't committed a crime. Yes, Don't I have any rights? Left. The checker looked stunned. Then he laughed. I thought I'd explained. The man you turn think you left. are is dead. Corbell's will was probated long ago. His widow... Damn it, I left money to myself. No good. Though the man still smiled, his face Go was impersonal, on. remote, unreachable. A vet smiles reassuringly at a cat due to be fixed. Get ready to a dead on. man can't own property. That was settled in the courts long ago. It wasn't fair to the heirs. Corbell jerked an unexpectedly bony thumb at his bony chest. Turn left. But I'm alive now. Not in law. You can earn your new life. The Get state will give you a new birth life. certificate and citizenship if you give the state good reason. Corbell Turn sat left. for a moment, absorbing that. Then he got off the table. You Let's get started then. Destiny. What do you need to know about me? Is now your name? Jerome Branch Corbell. Call me Pierce. The checker did not offer to shake hands. Neither did Corbell. Perhaps because he sensed the man would not respond. Perhaps because they were both noticeably overdue for a bath. I'm your checker. Do you like people? I'm just asking. We'll test you in detail later. I get along with the people around me, but I like my privacy. The checker frowned. That narrows it more than you might think. The isolationism you called privacy was, well, a passing fad. We don't have the room for it, or the inclination either. We can't send you to a colony world. I might make a good colonist. I like travel. You'd make terrible breeding stock. Remember, the genes aren't yours. No, you get one choice, Corbell. Rammer. Rammer? I'm afraid so. That's the first strange word you've used since okay, I woke up. Here we go. In fact, hasn't the language changed at all? You don't even have an accent. Part of my profession. I learned your speech through RNA training many years ago. You'll learn your trade the same way, if you get that far. You'll be amazed how fast you learn with RNA shots to help you along. But you'd better be right about liking your privacy, Corbell and about liking to travel, too. Can you take orders? I was in the army. What does that mean? Means yes. Good. Do you like strange places and faraway people, or vice versa? Both. Corbell smiled Turn hopefully. Left. I've raised buildings all over the world. Can the world use another architect? No. Do you feel that the state owes you something? There could be but one answer to that. No. But you had yourself frozen. You must have felt that the future owed you something. Not at all. It was a good risk. I was dying. Ah, the checker looked him over thoughtfully. If you had something to believe in, perhaps dying wouldn't mean so much. Corbell said nothing. They gave him a short word association test in English. That test made Corbell suspect that a good many corpsicles must date from near his own death in 1970. They took a blood sample, then exercised him to exhaustion and took another blood sample. They tested his pain threshold by direct nerve stimulation, excruciatingly unpleasant, then took another blood sample. They gave him a Chinese puzzle and told him to take it apart. Pierce then informed him that the testing was over. After all, we already know the state of your health. Then why the blood samples? The checker looked at him for a moment. You tell me. Get ready to turn left. Something about that look gave Corbell the creepy feeling that he was on trial for his life. The feeling might have been caused only by the checker's turn rather left, narrow features, his right. icy blue gaze and abstracted smile. Still, Pierce had stayed turn with him right. all through the testing, watching him as if Corbell's behavior was a reflection on Pierce's judgment. Corbell thought carefully before he spoke. Get ready to you turn have to right. know how far I'll go before I quit. You can analyze the blood samples for adrenaline and fatigue poisons Turn to find left. out just how much I was hurting, just how tired I really was. That's right, said the checker. Keep right, Corbell had survived right. again. He would have given up much earlier on the pain test, but Turn at some right. point, Pierce had mentioned that Corbell was the fourth corpsical personality to be tested in that empty body. He remembered going on. to sleep that last time, 220 years ago. 
His family and friends had been all around him, acting like mourners. He had chosen the coffin, paid for vault space, and made out his last will and testament. But he had not thought of it Keep as right. dying. He had been given a right. shot. The eternal pain had drifted away in a soft haze. He had turn gone to right. sleep. He had drifted off wondering about the future, wondering what he would wake to. A vault into the unknown. World government? Interplanetary spacecraft? Clean fusion power? Strange clothing, body paints, nudism? New principles of architecture, floating houses, arcologies? Or, crowding, poverty, all the fuels used up, power provided by cheap labor? He thought of those, but they didn't worry him. The world could not afford to wake him if it was that poor. The world he dreamed of in those last moments was a rich world, able to support such luxuries as J.B. Corbell. It looked like he wasn't going to see too damn much of it. Someone led him away after the testing. The guard walked with a meaty hand wrapped around Corbell's thin upper arm. Leg irons would have been no more effective had Corbell thought of escaping. The guard took him up a narrow staircase to the roof. The noon sun blazed in a blue sky that shaded to yellow, then brown at the horizon. Green plants grew in close-packed rows on parts of the roof. Elsewhere, many sheets of something glassy were exposed to the sunlight. Corbell caught one glimpse of the world from a bridge between two roofs. It was a cityscape of close-packed buildings, all of the same cold, cubistic design. And Corbell was impossibly high on a narrow strip of concrete with no guardrails at all. He froze. He stopped breathing. The guard did not speak. He tugged at Corbell's arm, not hard and watched to see what he would do. Corbell pulled himself together and went on. The room was all bunks, two walls of bunks with a gap between. The light was cool and artificial, but outside it was nearly noon. Could they be expecting him to sleep? But jet lag had never bothered Corbell. The room was big, a thousand bunks big. Most of the bunks were full. A few occupants watched incuriously as the guard showed Corbell which bunk was his. It was the bottommost in a stack of six. Corbell had to drop to his knees and roll to get into it. The bedclothes were strange, silky and very smooth, even slippery, the only touch of luxury about the place. But there was no top sheet, nothing to cover him. He lay on his side, looking out at the dormitory from near floor level. Now, finally, he could let himself think. I'm alive. Earlier it might have been a fatal distraction. He'd been holding it back. I made it. I'm alive. And young. That wasn't even in the contract. But, he thought reluctantly, because it would not stay buried. Who is it that's alive? Some kind of composite? A criminal rehabilitated with the aid of some spare chemicals? And an electric brainwashing device? No. J.B. Corbell is alive and well if a trifle confused. Once he had had that rare ability, he could go to sleep anywhere, anytime. But sleep was very far from him now. He watched and tried to learn. Three things were shocking about that place. One was the smell. Apparently, perfumes and deodorants had been another passing fad. Pierce had been overdue for a bath. So was the new, improved Corbell. Here, the smell was rich. The second was the loving bunks, four of them in a vertical stack, twice as wide as the singles and with thicker mattresses. The doubles were for loving, not sleeping. What shocked Corbell was that they were right out in the open, not hidden by so much as a gauze curtain. The same was true of the toilets. How can they live like this? Corbell rubbed his nose and jumped, and cursed at himself for jumping. His own nose had been big and fleshy and somewhat shapeless, but the nose he now rubbed automatically when trying to think was small and narrow with a straight, sharp edge. He might very well get used to the smell and everything else before he got used to his own nose. Eventually, he slept. Sometime after dusk, a man came for him, a broad, brawny type wearing a gray jumper and a broad, expressionless face. The guard was not one to waste words. He found Corbell's bunk, pulled Corbell out by one arm, and led him stumbling away. Corbell was facing Pierce before he was fully awake. 
In annoyance, he asked, Doesn't anyone else speak English? No, said the checker. Pierce and the guard guided Corbell to a comfortable armchair facing a wide, curved screen. They put padded earphones on him. They set a plastic bottle of clear fluid on a shelf over his head. Corbell noticed a clear plastic tube tipped with a hypodermic needle. Breakfast? Pierce missed the sarcasm. You'll have one meal each day, after learning period and exercise. He inserted the needle into a vein in Corbell's arm. He covered the wound with a blob of what might have been silly putty. Corbell watched it all without emotion. If he had ever been afraid of needles, the months of pain and cancer had worked it out of him. A needle was surcease, freedom from pain for a while. Learn now, said Pierce. This knob controls speed. The volume is set for your hearing. You may replay any section once. Don't worry about your arm. You can't pull the tube loose. There's something I wanted to ask you, only I couldn't remember the word. What's a rammer? Starship pilot. Corbell studied the checker's face without profit. You're kidding. No. Learn now. The checker turned on Corbell's screen and went away. Two. A rammer was the pilot of a starship. The starships were bussard ramjets. They caught interstellar hydrogen in immaterial nets of electromagnetic force, compressed and guided it into a ring of pinched force fields, and there burned it in a fusion fire. Potentially, there was no limit at all on the speed of a bussard ramjet. The ships were enormously powerful, enormously complex, enormously expensive. Corbell thought it incredible that the state would trust so much value, such devastating power and mass, to one man. To a man two centuries dead. Why, Corbell was an architect, not an astronaut. It was news to him that the concept of the Bussard ramjet predated his own death. He had watched the Apollo 11 and 13 flights on television, and that had been the extent of his interest in spaceflight until now. Now his life depended on his rammer career. He never doubted it. That was what kept Corbell in front of the screen with the earphones on his head for 14 hours that first day. He was afraid he might be tested. He didn't understand all he was supposed to learn, but he was not tested either. The second day he began to get interested. By the third day he was fascinated. Things he had never understood, relativity and magnetic theory and abstract mathematics, he now grasped intuitively. It was marvelous. And he ceased to wonder why the state had chosen Jerome Corbell. It was always done this way. It made sense, all kinds of sense. The payload of a starship was small, and its operating lifetime was more than a man's lifetime. A reasonably safe life support system for one man occupied an unreasonably high proportion of the payload. The rest must go for biological package probes. A crew of more than one was out of the question. A good, capable, loyal citizen was not likely to be enough of a loner. In any case, why send a citizen? The times would change drastically before a Cedar ramship could return. The state itself might change beyond recognition. A returning rammer must adjust to a whole new culture. There was no way to tell in advance what it might be like. Why not pick a man who had already chosen to He's adjust left. to a new culture? A man whose own culture was already two centuries dead when the trip started. And a man who already owed the state his life. The RNA was most effective. Corbell stopped wondering about Pierce's dispassionately possessive attitude. He began to think of himself as property being programmed for a purpose. And he learned. He skimmed microtaped texts as if they were already familiar. The process was heady. He became convinced that he could rebuild a cedar ramship with his bare hands, given the parts. He had loved figures all his life, but abstract math had been beyond him until now. Field theory, monopole field equations, circuitry design when to suspect the presence of a gravitational point source, how to locate it, use it, avoid it. The teaching chair was his life. The rest of his time, exercise, dinner, sleep, seemed vague, uninteresting. He exercised with about 20 others in a room too small for the purpose. Like Corbell, the others were lean and stringy, in sharp contrast to the brawny wedge-shaped men who were their guards. They followed the lead of a guard, 
running in place because there was no room for real running, forming in precise rows for scissors jumps, push-ups, sit-ups. After 14 hours in a teaching chair, Corbell usually enjoyed the jumping about. He followed orders, and he wondered about the stick in a holster at each guard's waist. It looked like a cop's baton. It might have been just that, except for the hole in one end. Corbell never tried to find out. Sometimes he saw Pierce during the exercise periods. Pierce and the men who tended the teaching chairs were of a third type, well-fed, in adequate condition, but just on the verge of being overweight. Corbell thought of them as old American types. From Pierce he learned something of the other professions open to a revived, corpsical, reprogrammed criminal. Stoop labor, intensive hand cultivation of crops, body servants, handicrafts, any easily taught repetitive work, and the hours. The corpsicles were expected to work 14 hours a day, and the crowding. Not that his own situation was much different. 14 hours to study, an hour of heavy exercise, an hour to eat, and eight hours to sleep in a dorm that was two solid walls of people. Time to work, time to eat, time to sleep, elbow to elbow every minute. The poor bastards, he said to Pierce. What kind of a life is that? It lets them repay their debt to the state as quickly as possible. Be reasonable, Corbell. What would a corpsicle do with his off hours? He has no social life. He has to learn one by observing citizens. Many forms of felon's labor involve proximity to citizens. So they can look up at their betters while they work? That's no way to learn. It would take... I get the feeling we're talking about decades of this kind of thing. Thirty years' labor generally earns a man his citizenship. That gets him a right to work, which then gets him a guaranteed base income he can use to buy education shots and tapes. And the medical benefits are impressive. We live longer than you used to, Corbell. Meanwhile, it's slave labor. Anyway, none of this applies to me. No, of course not. Corbell, you're wrong to call it slave labor. A slave can't quit. You can change jobs any time you like. There's a clear freedom of choice. Corbell shivered. Any slave can commit suicide. Suicide, my ass, the checker said distinctly. If he had anything that could be called an accent, it lay in the precision of his pronunciation. Jerome Corbell is dead. I could have given you his intact skeleton for a souvenir. I don't doubt it. Corbell saw himself tenderly polishing his own white bone. But where could he have kept such a thing? In his bunk? Well then, you're a brain-wiped criminal. Justly brain-wiped, I might add. Your crime has cost you your citizenship, but you still have the right to change professions. You need only ask for another, um, course of rehabilitation. What slave can change jobs at will? It would feel like dying. Nonsense. You go to sleep. Only that. When you wake up, you've got a different set of memories. The subject was an unpleasant one. Corbell avoided it from then on. But he could not avoid talking to the checker. Pierce was the only man in the world he could talk to. On the days Pierce failed to show up, he felt angry, frustrated. Once he asked about gravitational point sources. My time didn't know about those. Yes, it did. Neutron stars and black holes. You had a number of pulsars located by 1970, and the mathematics to describe how a pulsar decays. The thing to watch for is a decayed pulsar directly in your path. Don't worry about black holes. There are none near your course. Okay. Pierce regarded him in some amusement. You really don't know much about your own time, do you? Come on, I was an architect. What would I know about astrophysics? We didn't have your learning techniques. Which reminded him of something. Pierce, you said you learned English with RNA injections. Where does the RNA come from? Pierce smiled and walked away. He had little time to remember. For that he was almost grateful. But very occasionally, lying wakeful in his bunk, listening to the shh, shh, shh of a thousand people breathing and the different sounds from the loving bunks, he would remember someone. It didn't matter who. At first it had been Mirabel, always Mirabel. Mirabel at the tiller as they sailed out of San Pedro Harbor, tanned, square face, laughing mouth, 
extravagantly large dark glasses. Mirabelle, older and marked by months of strain, saying goodbye at his funeral. Mirabelle on their honeymoon. In twenty-two years they had grown together like two touching limbs of a tree. But now he thought of her, when he thought of her, as two hundred years dead. And his niece was dead, though he and Mirabelle had barely made it to her confirmation. The pains had been getting bad then. And his daughter, Anne, and all three of his grandchildren, just infants they had been. It didn't matter who it was that floated up into his mind. Everyone was dead. Everyone but him. Corbell did not want to die. He was disgustingly healthy and twenty years younger than he had been at death. He found his rammer education continually fascinating. If only they would stop treating him like property. Corbell had been in the army, but that was twenty years ago. Make that two hundred and forty. He had learned to take orders, but never to like it. What had galled him then was the basic assumption of his inferiority. But no army officer in Corbell's experience had believed in Corbell's inferiority as completely as did Pierce and Pierce's guards. The checker never repeated a command, never seemed even to consider that Corbell might refuse. If Corbell refused even once, he knew what would happen. Pierce knew that he knew. The atmosphere better fitted a death camp than an army. They must think I'm a zombie. Corbell was careful not to pursue the thought. He was a corpse brought back to life, but not all the way. What did they do with the skeleton? Cremate it? The life was not pleasant. His last class citizenship was galling. There was nobody to talk to, nobody but Pierce, whom he was learning to hate. He was hungry much of the time. The single daily meal filled his belly, but it would not stay full. No wonder he had wakened so lean. More and more he lived in the teaching chair. In the teaching chair he was a rammer. His impotence was changed to omnipotence. Starman, riding the fire that feeds the suns, scooping fuel from interstellar space itself, spreading electromagnetic fields like wings hundreds of miles out. Two weeks after the state had wakened him from the dead, Corbell was given his course. He relaxed in a chair that was not quite a contour couch. RNA solution dripped into him. He no longer yeah. noticed the needle. The teaching screen held a map of his course in green lines in three space. Corbell had stopped wondering how the three-dimensional effect was achieved. The scale was shrinking as he watched. Two tiny blobs and a glowing ball surrounded by a faintly glowing corona. This part of the course he already knew. A linear accelerator would launch him from the moon, boost him to bussard ramjet speeds and hurl him at the sun. Solar gravity would increase his speed while his electromagnetic fields caught and burned the solar wind itself. Then out, still accelerating. In the teaching screen the scale shrank horrendously. The distances between stars were awesome, terrifying. Van Manen's star was twelve light years away. He would begin deceleration a bit past the midpoint. The matching would be tricky. He must slow enough to release the biological package probe, but not enough to drop him below ram speeds. In addition, he must use the mass of Van Manen's star for a course change. There was no room for error here. Then on to the next target, which was even further away. Corbell watched, and he absorbed, and a part of him seemed to have known everything all along, even while another part was gasping at the distances. Ten Go stars, all yellow dwarves of the soul type, an average of fifteen light years apart, though he would cross one gap of fifty-two light years. He would almost touch light speed on that one. Oddly enough, the Bussard ramjet effect would improve at such speeds. He could take advantage of the greater hydrogen flux to pull the fields closer to the ship to intensify them. Ten stars in a closed path, a badly bent and battered ring leading him back to the solar system and Earth. He would benefit from the time he spent near light speed. Though three hundred years would have passed on Earth, Corbell would only have lived through two hundred years of ship's time, which still implied some kind of suspended animation technique. It didn't hit him the first time through, nor the second, but repetition had been built into the teaching program. It didn't hit him until he was on his way to the exercise room. Three hundred years? Three hundred years! Three. 
It wasn't night, not really. Outside, it must be mid-afternoon. Indoors, the dorm was always coolly lit, barely bright enough to read by, if there had been books. There were no windows. Corbell should have been asleep. He suffered every minute he spent gazing out into the dorm. Most of the others were asleep, but a couple made noisy love on one of the loving bunks. A few men lay on their backs with their eyes open. Two women talked in low voices. Corbell didn't know the language. He had been unable to find anyone who spoke English. Corbell was desperately homesick. The first few days had been the worst. He had stopped noticing the smell. If he thought of it, he could sniff the traces of billions of human beings. Otherwise, the odor was part of the background noise. But the loving bunks bothered him. When they were in use, he watched. When he forced himself not to watch, he listened. He couldn't help himself. But he had turned down two sign language invitations from a small brunette with straggly hair and a pretty elfin face. Make love in public? He couldn't. He could avoid using the loving bunks, but not the exposed toilets. That was embarrassing. The first time he was able to force himself only by staring rigidly at his feet. When he pulled on his jumper and looked up, a number of sleepers were watching him in obvious amusement. The reason might have been his self-consciousness, or the way he dropped his jumper around his ankles, or he may have been out of line. A pecking order determined who might use the toilets before whom. He still hadn't figured out the details. Corbell wanted to go home. The idea was unreasonable. His home was gone, and he would have gone with it if it weren't for the corpsical crypts. But reason was of no use in this instance. He wanted to go home. Home to Mirabel. Home to anywhere. Rome, San Francisco, Kansas City, Brasilia. He had lived in all those places. All different, but all home. Corbell had been at home anywhere, but he was not at home here, and never would be. Now they would take here away from him. Even this world of four rooms and two roofs, elbow-to-elbow -elbow people and utter slavery, this world, which they could not even show him, would have vanished when he returned from the stars. Corbell rolled over and buried his face in his arms. If he didn't sleep, he would be groggy tomorrow. He might miss something essential. They had never tested his training. Not yet. Not yet. He dozed. He came awake suddenly, already up on one elbow, groping for some elusive thought. Ah, why haven't I been wondering about the biological package probes? A moment later, he did wonder. What are the biological package probes? But the wonder was that he had never wondered. He knew what and where they were, heavy fat cylinders arranged around the waist of the starship's hull. Ten of these, each weighing almost as much as Corbell's own life support system. He knew their mass distribution, he knew the clamp system that held them to the hull, and he could operate and repair the clamps under various extremes of damage. He almost knew where the probes went when released. It was just on the tip of his tongue, which meant that he had had the RNA shot, but had not yet seen the instructions. But he didn't know what the probes were for. It was like that with the ship, he realized. He knew everything there was to know about a cedar ram ship, but nothing at all about the other kinds of starships or interplanetary travel or ground-to-orbit vehicles. He knew that he would be launched by linear accelerator from the moon. He knew the design of the accelerator. He could see it. 350 kilometers of rings standing on end in a line across a level lunar mare. Go straight on. He knew what to do if anything went wrong during launch. And that was all he knew about the moon and lunar installations and lunar conquest, barring what he had watched on television over 200 years ago. What was going on out there? In the two weeks since his arrival, awakening, creation, he had seen four rooms and two rooftops, glimpsed a rectilinear cityscape from a bridge, and talked to one man who was not interested in telling him anything. What had happened in 200 years? These men and women who slept around him, who were they? Why were they here? He didn't even know if they were corpsical or contemporary. Contemporary, probably. Not one of them was self-conscious about the facilities. Corbell had raised buildings in all sorts of strange places, but he had never jumped blind. He had always brushed up on the language and studied the customs before he went. Here he had no handle, nowhere to start. He was lost. 
Oh, for someone to talk to. He was learning in enormous gulps, taking in volumes of knowledge so broad that he hadn't realized how rigidly bounded they were. The state was teaching him only what he needed to know. Every bit of information was aimed straight at his profession. Rammer. He could see the reasoning. He would be gone for several centuries. Why should the state teach him anything at all about today's technology, customs, politics? There would be trouble enough when he came back, if he... Come to that, who had taught him to call the government the state? How had he come to think of the state as all-powerful? He knew nothing of its power and extent. It must be the RNA training. With data came attitudes below the conscious level, where he couldn't get at them. That made his skin crawl. They were changing him around again. Sure, why shouldn't the state trust him with a cedar ramship? They were feeding him state-oriented patriotism through a silver needle. He had lost his people. He had lost his world. He would lose this one. According to Pierce, he had lost himself four times already. A condemned criminal had had his personality wiped four times. Corbell's goddamned skeleton had probably been ground up for phosphates. But this was the worst, that his beliefs and motivations were being lost, bit by bit, to the RNA solution, while the state made him over into a rammer. There was nothing that was his. He failed to see Pierce at the next exercise period. It was just as well. He was somewhat groggy. As usual, he ate dinner like a starving man. He returned to the dorm, rolled into his bunk, and was instantly asleep. He looked up during study period the next day and found Pierce watching him. He blinked, fighting free of a massive data on the attitude jet system that bled plasma from the inboard fusion plant that was also the emergency electrical power source, and asked, Pierce, what's a biological package probe? I would have thought they would teach you that. You know what to do with the probes, don't you? The teaching which it gave me the procedures two days ago. Slow up for certain systems, kill the fields, turn a probe loose and speed up again. You don't have to aim them? No. I gather they aim themselves. But I have to get them down below a certain velocity, where they'll fall right through the system. Amazing. They must do all the rest of it themselves. Pierce shook his head. I wouldn't have believed it. Well, Corbell, the probes steer for an otherwise terrestrial world with a reducing atmosphere. They outnumber oxygen-nitrogen worlds about three to one in this region of the galaxy, and probably everywhere else, too, as you may know if your age got that far. But what do the probes do? They're biological packages, a dozen different strains of algae, the idea is to turn a reducing atmosphere into an oxygen atmosphere, just the way photosynthetic life forms did for Earth, something like 15 times 10 to the eighth years ago. Keep left. The checker smiled, barely. His small, narrow mouth wasn't built to express any great emotion. You're part of a big project. Good Lord, how long does it take? We think about 50,000 years. Obviously, we've never had the chance to measure it. But good Lord. Do you really think the state will last that long? Does even the state think it'll last that long? That's not your affair, Corbell. Still, Pierce considered. I don't suppose I do, or the state does. But humanity will last. One day there will be men on those worlds. It's a cause, Corbell. The immortality of the species. A thing bigger than one man's life. And you're part of it. He looked at Corbell expectantly. Corbell was deep in thought. He was running a fingertip back and forth along the straight line of his nose. Presently, he asked, What's it like out there? The stars? You're... No, no, no. The city. I catch just a glimpse of it twice a day. Cubistic buildings with elaborate carvings at the street level. What the bleep is this, Corbell? You don't need to know anything about Cilador. By the time you come home, the whole city will be changed. I know, I know. That's why I hate to leave without seeing something of the world. I could be going out to die. Corbell stopped. He had seen that considering look before, but he had never seen Pierce actually angry. The checker's voice was flat, his mouth pinched tight. You think of yourself as a tourist. So would you if you found yourself 200 years in the future. If you didn't have that much curiosity, you wouldn't be human. Granted that I'd want to look around, 
I certainly wouldn't demand it as a right. What were you thinking when you foisted yourself off on the future? Did you think the future owed you a debt? It's the other way around, and time you realized it. Corbell was silent. I'll tell you something. You're a rammer because you're a born tourist. We tested you for that. Go straight on. You like the unfamiliar. It doesn't send you scuttling back to something safe and known. That's rare. The checker's eyes said, and that's why I've decided not to wipe your personality yet. His mouth said, Was there anything else? Corbell pushed his luck. I'd like a chance to practice with a computer like the ship's autopilot computer. We don't have one, but you'll get your chance in two days. You're leaving then. Four. The next day, he received his instructions for entering the solar system. He had been alive for 17 days. The instructions were understandably vague. He was to try anything and everything to make contact with a drastically changed state, up to and including flashing his attitude jets in binary code. He was to start these procedures a good distance out. It was not impossible that the state would be at war with something. He should be signaling not a warship. He found that he would not be utterly dependent on rescue ships. He could slow the ram ship by breaking directly into the solar wind until the proton flux was too slow to help him, then whip around Sol and back out, slowing on attitude jets, using whatever hydrogen was left in the inboard tank. That was emergency fuel. Given no previous emergencies, a nearly full tank would actually get him to the moon and land him there. The state would be through with him once he dropped his last probe. It was good of the state to provide for his return, Corbell thought, and then he shook himself. The state was not altruistic. It wanted the ship back. Now, more than ever, Corbell wanted a chance at the autopilot computer. He found one last opportunity to talk to the checker. A 300-year round trip, maybe 200 ships' time, Corbell said. I get some advantage from relativity. But, Pierce, you don't really expect me to live 200 years, do you? With nobody to talk to? The cold sleep treatment, even so. Pierce frowned. You've been briefed on the cold sleep procedure, but you haven't studied medicine. I'm told that cold sleep has a rejuvenating effect over long periods. You'll spend perhaps 20 years awake and the rest in cold sleep. The medical facilities are automatic. You've been instructed how to use them. Do you think we'd risk your dying out there between the stars, where it would be impossible to replace you? No. Was there anything else you wanted to see me about? Yes. He had decided not to broach the subject. Now he changed his mind. I'd like to take a woman with me. The life support system would hold two of us. I worked it out. We'd need another cold sleep chamber, of course. For two weeks, this had been the only man Corbell could talk to. At first, he had found Pierce unfathomable, unreadable, almost inhuman. Since then, he had learned to read the checker's face to some extent. Pierce was deciding whether to terminate Jerome Corbell and start over. It was a close thing, but the state had spent considerable time and effort on Jerome Corbell. It was worth a try, and so Pierce said, That would take up some space. You would have to share the rest between you. I do not think you would survive. But... What we can do is this. We can put the mind of a woman in your computer. The computer is voice-controlled, and her voice would be that of a woman, any type of woman you choose. A subplot enclosing the personality of a woman would leave plenty of circuitry for the computer's vital functions. I don't think you quite get the point. Uh, look here, Corbell. We know you don't need a woman. If you did, you would have taken one by now, and we would have wiped you and started over. You've lived in the dormitory for two weeks, and you have not used the mating facilities once. Damn it, Pierce, do you expect me to make love in public? I can't. Exactly. But, Corbell, you learned to use the toilet, didn't you? Because you had to. You know what to do with a woman, but you are one of those men fortunate enough not to need one. Otherwise, you could not be a rammer. If Corbell had hit the checker then, he would have done it knowing uh, that it meant his go death. Straight on. And knowing that, he would have killed Pierce by forcing him to it. Something like ten seconds elapsed. Pierce watched him in frank curiosity. When he saw Corbell relax, he said, You leave tomorrow. Your training is finished. Goodbye. Corbell walked away, clenching and unclenching his fists. 
The dormitory had been a test. He knew it now. Could he cross a narrow bridge with no handrails? Then he was not pathologically afraid of falling. Could he spend two hundred years alone in the cabin of a starship? Then the silent people around him, five above his head, hundreds to either side, Go must make him on. markedly uncomfortable. Could he live twenty waking years without a woman? Surely he must be impotent. He returned to the dorm after dinner. They had replaced the bridge with a nearly invisible slab of glass. Corbell snarled and crossed ahead of the guard. The guard had to hurry to keep up. He stood between two walls of occupied bunks, looking around him. He had already refrained from killing the checker. He must have decided to live. What he did then was stupid. He knew it. He looked about him until he found the slender, dark-haired girl with the elfin face, watching him curiously from near the ceiling. He climbed the rungs between the bunks until his face was level with hers. The gesture he needed was a quick, formalized one, but he didn't know it. In English he asked, Come with me? She nodded brightly and followed him down the ladder. By then it seemed to Corbell that the dorm was alive on. with barely audible voices. The odd one, the rammer trainee. Certainly a number of the wakeful turned on their sides to watch. He felt their eyes on the back of his neck as he zipped open his gray jumpsuit and stepped out of it. The dormitory had been a series of tests. At least two of those eyes would record his doings for Pierce. But to Corbell, they were just like all the others, all the eyes curiously watching to see how the speechless one would make out. And, sure enough, he was impotent. It was the eyes, and he was naked. The girl was at first concerned, then pitying. She stroked his cheek in apology or sympathy, and then she went away and found someone else. Corbell lay listening to them, gazing at the bunk above him. He waited for eight hours. Finally, a guard came to take him away. By then, he didn't care what they did with him. Five. He didn't start to care until the guard's floating jeep pulled up beneath an enormous twenty-two cartridge standing on end. Then he began to wonder. It was too small to be a rocket ship. But it was. They strapped him into a contour couch, one of three in a cabin with a single window. There were the guard and Corbell and a man who might have been Pierce's second cousin once removed, the pilot. He had the window. Corbell's heartbeat quickened. He wondered how it would be. It was as if he had suddenly become very heavy. He heard no noise except right at the beginning, a sound like landing gear being raised on an airplane. Not a rocket, Corbell thought. Possibly the ferry ship's drive was electromagnetic in nature. He remembered the tricks the Bussard ramjet could play with magnetic fields. He was heavy, and he hadn't slept last night. He went to sleep. When he woke, he was in freefall. Nobody had tried to tell him anything about freefall. The guard and pilot were watching. Screw you, said Corbell. It was another test. He got the straps open and pushed himself over to the window. The pilot laughed, caught him, and held him while he closed a protective cover over the instruments. Then he let go, and Corbell drifted in front of the window. His belly was revolving eccentrically. His inner ear was going crazy. His testicles were tight up against his groin, and that didn't feel good either. He was falling, falling. Corbell snarled within his mind and tried to concentrate on the window. But the earth was not visible. Neither was the moon. Just a lot of stars. Bright enough, quite bright in fact. Even more brilliant than they had been above a small boat, anchored off Catalina Island on many nights long ago. He watched them for some time, trying to keep his mind off that falling elevator sensation. He wasn't about to get himself disqualified now. They ate aboard, in freefall. Corbell copied the others, picking chunks of meat and potatoes out of a plastic bag of stew, pulling them through a membrane that sealed itself behind his pick. Of all the things I'm going to miss, he told the broad-faced guard, I'm going to enjoy missing you most, you and your goddamned staring eyes. The guard smiled placidly and waited to see if Corbell would get sick. They landed a day after takeoff on a broad plain where the earth sat nestled among sharp lunar peaks. One day instead of three, the state had expended extra power to get him here, but an earth moon flight must be a small thing these days. The plain was black with blast pits. It must have been a landing field for decades. 
transparent bubbles clustered near the runway end of the linear accelerator. There were buildings and groves of trees inside the bubbles. Spacecraft of various shapes and sizes were scattered about the plane. The biggest was Corbell's ram ship, a silver skyscraper lying on its side. The probes were in place, giving the ship a thick-waisted appearance. To Corbell's trained eye, it looked ready for takeoff. He was awed, he was humbled, he was proud. He tried to sort out his own reactions from RNA-inspired emotions, and probably failed. Corbell donned his suit first, while the pilot and guard watched to see if he would make a mistake. He took it slow. The suit came in two pieces, a skin-tight, rubbery body stocking, and a helmet attached to a heavy backpack. On the chest was a white spiral with tapered ends, the sign of the state. An electric cart came for them. Apparently, Corbell was not expected to know how to walk on an airless world. He thought to head for one of the domes, but the guard steered straight for the ship. It was a long way off. It had become unnervingly large when the guard stopped underneath. A fat cylinder the size of a house swelled above the jeep, the life support section, bound to the main hull by a narrower neck. The smaller dome at the nose must be the control room. The guard said, Now you inspect your ship. You can talk? Yes. Yesterday. A quick course. Oh. Three things wrong with your ship. You find all three. You tell me. I tell him. Him? Oh, the pilot. Then what? Then you fix one of the things. We fix the others. Then we launch you. It was another test, of course. Maybe the last. Corbell was furious. He started immediately with the field generators, and gradually he forgot the guard and the pilot and the sword still hanging over his head. He knew this ship. As it had been with the teaching chair, so it was with the ship itself. Corbell's impotence changed to omnipotence. The power of the beast, the intricacy, the potential, the... The hydrogen tank held far too much pressure. That wouldn't wait. I'll slurry this now, he told the guard. Get a tanker over there to top it off. He bled hydrogen gas slowly through the valve, lowering the fuel's vapor pressure without letting fuel boil out of the valve itself. When he finished, the liquid hydrogen would be slushy with frozen crystals under near-vacuum pressure. He finished the external inspection without finding anything more. It figured. The banks of dials would hold vastly more information than a man's eyes could read through opaque titan alloy skin. The airlock was a triple-door type not so much to save air as to give him an airlock oven if he lost a door somehow. Corbell shut the outer door, used the others when green lights indicated he could. He looked down at the telltales under his chin as he started to unclamp his helmet. Vacuum? He stopped. The ship's gauges said air. The suits said vacuum, which was right. Come to that, he hadn't heard any hissing. Just how soundproof was his helmet? just like Pierce, to wait and see if he would take off his helmet in a vacuum. Well, how to test? Ha! Corbell found the head, turned on a water faucet. The water splashed oddly in lunar gravity. It did not boil. Did a flaw in his suit constitute a flaw in the ship? Corbell doffed his helmet and continued his inspection. There was no way to test the ramfield generators without causing all kinds of havoc in the linear accelerator. He checked out the telltales, then concentrated on the life support mechanisms. The tailored plants in the air system were alive and well, but the urea absorption mechanism was plugged somehow. That would be a dirty job. He postponed it. He decided to finish his inspection. The state might have missed something. It was his ship, his life. The cold sleep chamber was like a great coffin, a corpsical coffin. Corbell shuddered, remembering two hundred years spent waiting in liquid nitrogen. He wondered again if Jerome Corbell were really dead, and then he shook off the thought and went to work. No flaws in the cold sleep system. He went on. The computer was acting vaguely funny. He had a hell of a time tracing the problem. There was a minute break in one superconducting circuit, so small that some current was leaking through anyway, by inductance. Bastards. He donned his suit and went out to report. The guard heard him out, consulted with the other man, then told Corbell, You did good. 
Now finish with the topping off procedure. We fixed the other things. There's something wrong with my suit, too. New suit aboard now. I want some time with the computer. I want to be sure it's all right now. We fixed it good. When you top off fuel, you leave. That suddenly, Corbell felt a vast sinking sensation. The whole moon was dropping away under him. They launched him hard. Corbell saw red before his eyes, felt his cheeks dragged far back toward his ears. The ship would be all right. It was built to stand electromagnetic eddy currents from any direction. He survived. He fumbled out of his couch in time to watch the moonscape flying under him, receding, a magnificent view. There were days of freefall. He was not yet moving at ramscoop speeds. But the state had aimed him inside the orbit of Mercury, straight into the thickening solar wind. Protons, thick fuel for the ram fields, and a boost from the sun's gravity. Meanwhile, he had most of a day to play with the computer. At one point it occurred to him that the state might monitor his computer work. He shrugged it off. Probably it was too late for the state to stop him now. In any case, he had said too much already. He finished his work with the computer and got answers that satisfied him. At higher speeds, the ram fields were self-reinforcing. They would support themselves and the ship. He could find no upper limit to the velocity of a cedar ram ship. With all the time in the world, then, he sat down at the control console and began to play with the fields. They emerged like invisible wings. He felt the buffeting of badly controlled bursts of fusing hydrogen. He kept the fields close to the ship, fearful of losing the balance, here where the streaming of protons was so uneven. He could feel how he was doing. He could fly this ship by the seat of his pants, with RNA training to help him. He felt like a giant, this enormous phallic, germinal flying thing of metal and fire, carrying the seeds of life for worlds that had never known life. He roared around the sun and out. The thrust dropped a bit then, because he and the solar wind were moving in the same direction. But he was catching it, in his nets, like wind in a sail, guiding it and burning it and throwing it behind him. The ship moved faster every second. This feeling of power, enormous masculine power, had to be partly RNA training. At this point, he didn't care. Part was him, Jerome Corbell. Around the orbit of Mars, when he was sure that a glimpse of sunlight would not blind him, he instructed the computer to give him a full view. The walls of the spherical control room seemed to disappear. The sky blazed around him. There were no planets nearby. All he saw of the sky was myriads of brilliant pinpoints, mostly white, some showing traces of color. But there was more to see. Fusing hydrogen made a ghostly ring of light around his ship. It would grow stronger. So far his thrust was low, somewhat more than enough to balance the thin pull of the sun. He started his turn around the orbit of Jupiter by adjusting the fields to channel the proton flow to the side. That helped him thrust, but it must have puzzled Pierce and the faceless state. They would assume he was playing with the fields, testing his equipment. Maybe. His curve was gradual. It would take them a while to notice. This was not according to plan. Originally, he had intended to be halfway to Van Manen's star before he changed course. That would have given him 15 years head start, in case he was wrong, in case the state could do something to stop him even now. That would have been wise, but he couldn't do it. Pierce might die in 30 years. Pierce might never know what Corbell had done, and that thought was intolerable. His thrust dropped to almost nothing in the outer reaches of the system. Protons were thin out here, but there were enough to push his velocity steadily higher, and that was what counted. The faster he went, the greater the proton flux. He was on his way. He was beyond Neptune when the voice of oh. Pierce the Checker oh, yeah, came to saying, This is Pierce for the state. Pierce for the state. Answer, Corbell. Do you have a malfunction? Can we help? We cannot send rescue, but we can advise. Pierce for the state. Pierce for the state. Corbell smiled tightly. Pierce? The checker's name had changed pronunciation in 200 years. Nice to see a good -looking Pierce had slipped back like to an old habit. RNA lessons love. forgotten. <laughs> he must be upset about something. Oh, yeah, no. Corbell spent 20 minutes finding the moon base with his signal laser. The beam was too narrow to permit sloppy handling. When he had it adjusted, he said, 
This is Corbell for himself. Corbell for himself. I'm fine. How are you? He spent more time at the computer. One thing had been bothering him. The return to Soul System. He planned to be away longer than the state would have expected. Suppose there was nobody on the moon when he returned. It was a problem, he found. If he could reach the moon on his remaining fuel, no emergencies, remember, he could reach the Earth's atmosphere. The ship was durable. It would stand a meteoric re-entry. But his attitude jets would not land him, properly speaking. Unless he could cut away part of the ship. The ramfield generators would no longer be needed then. Well, he would work it out somehow. Plenty of Fuck time. Fuck you looking at? Plenty of time. The answer from the moon took nine hours. Pierce for the state. Cobell, we don't understand. You are far off course. Your you first target was to be Van Manen's star. Go straight on. Instead, you seem to be curving around towards Sagittarius. There is no known Earth-like world Listen, in that direction. The what the bleep do you I'm think you're doing? Repeating. Pierce for the state. Pierce. Corbell tried to switch it off. The teaching chair hadn't told him about an off switch. Finally, and it should have been sooner, he told the computer to switch on. the receiver off. Somewhat later, he located the lunar base with his signal laser and began transmission. This is Corbell for himself. Corbell for himself. I'm getting sick and tired of having to find you every damn time I want to say something, so I'll give you this all at once. I'm not going to any of the stars on your list. It's occurred to me that the relativity equations work better for me the faster I go. If I stop every 15 light years to launch a probe, the way you want me to, I could spend 200 years at it and never get anywhere. Whereas if I just aim the ship in one direction and keep it going, I can build up a ferocious tau factor. It works out that I can reach the galactic hub in 21 years, ship's time, if I hold myself down to one gravity acceleration. And Pierce, I just can't resist the idea. You were the one who called me a born tourist, remember? Well, the stars in the galactic hub aren't like the stars in the arms, and they're packed a quarter to a half light year apart, according to your own theories. It must be passing strange in there. So I'll go exploring on my own. Maybe I'll find some of your reducing atmosphere planets and drop the probes there. Maybe I won't. I'll see you in about 70,000 years, your time. By then, your precious state may have withered away. Or you'll have colonies on the seeded planets, and some of them may have broken loose from you. I'll join one of them. Or... Corbell thought it through, rubbing the straight, sharp line of his nose. I'll have to check it out on the computer, he said. But if I don't like any of your worlds when I get back, there are always the clouds of Turn Magellan. Right. I'll bet they aren't more than 25 years away, ship's time. Turn right. Chapter 2 Don Juan. One. The naming of names was important to Corbell. Alone in his Don little Luminous. universe, disassociated from all mankind, with only himself and his bland-voiced computer to talk to, Corbell hung tags on everything. He called himself J.B. Corbell, as he had in his former life. Yes, it was a major decision. For a while, he was calling himself Corbell Mark II, Corpsical or rebellious brain erasure, lousy loser. He gave that up after the shape of his nose stopped bothering him, after he got used to the look and feel of his shorter arms and slender hands, his alien body. There were no mirrors on the ship. What he called the kitchen was a wall with slots and a menu display screen. The opposite wall was the health club, the exercise paraphernalia, and the outlets that would turn this area into sauna or shower or steam bath. The medical dispensary and diagnostic tools were forest lawn. Rerouting. The cold sleep tank was also in that room. The control room was a hollow sphere with a remarkable chair in the exact center, surrounded by a horseshoe-shaped bank of controls, and approached via a catwalk of metal lace. The chair would assume a fantastic variety of positions, and it gave indecently good massages. The spherical wall on. could disappear to display the black sky, as if Corbell and the control bank floated alone in space. It would display textbooks on astronomy or astrophysics or state history, or updated diagrams of the ship. Corbell called it the womb room. The computer could be voice operated from anywhere aboard. There was a helmet, like a hairdryer, with a thick cord attached that would plug the pilot directly into the computer's senses. 
Corbell was afraid to use it. The computer answered to Corbell refused to personalize it. He spoke to it only to give orders and request information. But he dithered for months before naming the great cedar ramship he had stolen from Pierce and the state. Don Juan, he called it, for its phallic overtones. Trivial decision, but that was Corbell's problem. He had already made his major decision. When he broke free of Pierce and drove for the galactic core, Don Juan should have capped his career then by blowing up. Twenty-one years from now, he could make his next major decision. A year on his way, and Corbell was starving for the sound of another voice. He dithered. What would Pierce say that would be worth the hearing? A year ago, he had hung up on Pierce. He had had the computer disconnect the message laser receiver as a gesture of contempt. That gesture was important. Could Pierce know, never mind how, that he was no longer talking to a void? Corbell held lengthy conversations about it. Can I possibly be that lonely? He demanded of himself. Or that bored? Or that desperate to hear another human voice again? Other than my own. His own voice echoed back from the womb room walls. Computer, he said at last. Reconnect the message laser receiver. And he waited. Nothing. Hours passed. And nothing. He was savage. Pierce must have given on. up. Somewhere in the city that Pierce had never shown Corbell, Pierce the Checker would be training another revived corpsicle. The voice caught him at breakfast three days later. Corbell! Huh? That was strange. Computer had never addressed him before. Was it an emergency? This is Pierce, you traitorous son of a bitch. Turn this ship around and carry out your mission. Get stuffed, Corbell said, feeling good. Get stuffed yourself, said the voice of Pierce, turned suddenly silky smooth. Something was wrong here. Don Juan was almost half a light year from Seoul. How could Pierce... Computer, switch off the message laser receiver. That won't work, Corbell. I've beamed my personality at your computer, over and over again for these past seven months. Turn us around or I'll cut off your air. Corbell yelled something obscene. The silence that followed commanded attention. The purr of air moving through the life support system was a sound he never heard anymore. But he heard its absence. Turn that back on, he cried in panic. Will you bargain, Corbell? Never. I'll throw... What was heavy and movable? Nothing? I'll pry the microwave oven loose and throw it into the computer. I'll give you nothing but a wrecked ship. Your mission... Shut up! The voice of Pierce the Checker was silent. Corbell heard the purr of moving air. What next? If Pierce controlled the computer, he controlled everything. Why didn't he turn the ship himself? Had he? Corbell climbed up into the womb room and settled in the control chair. Full view, he commanded. He floated alone in space. Half a light year of distance had not changed the pattern Go of the stars. A year of acceleration had. Don Juan was now meeting all light rays at an angle, so that the entire sky was puckered forward. In his first life, during nights spent aboard a small boat, Corbell had made a nodding acquaintance with the constellations. Sagittarius was just where he had left it, directly overhead. A ring of white flame around and below him was hydrogen, guided and constricted to fuse in stellar fire, the exhaust of his drive. Soul was a hot on. pink point beneath his feet, and something flickered across it. Corbell, staring, made out a humanoid form, barely blacker than space, walking toward him across the stars, coming close. Narrow features, light hair. It was Pierce. Corbell watched, barely breathing. Pierce was as big as Don Juan. Pierce was angry. Corbell said, Computer, get that mannequin off the screen. The figure vanished. Corbell resumed breathing. Pierce, or Pierce, or Computer, or whatever name you will answer to, I give you your orders. You will proceed to the galactic axis under one gravity of acceleration, making turnover at midpoint. You will take all necessary steps to guard my life and the integrity of the ship, subject to this mission. Now speak if you like. The voice of Pierce the Checker said, I prefer Pierce. Corbell sighed his relief. So do I. Are you in fact under my orders? Yes. Corbell, there are things we must discuss. 
You owe your very existence to the state. You've stolen a key to the survival of mankind itself. How many cedar ramships do you imagine we can build? How many package probes do you think will succeed in converting alien atmospheres to something men can breathe? Or do you think that men will never need to leave the Earth? Computer, you will henceforth answer to the name Pearsa. Pearsa, shut the fuck up. Silence. Now Corbell caught himself giggling occasionally. It could happen any time, at meals or sitting in the womb room watching the sky, or using the health club. He would suddenly start giggling. And then he couldn't stop, because Pearsa could hear, and Pearsa couldn't answer. Pearsa, the naming of names. Pierce the Checker was far in Corbell's past, while Pearsa was a personality imposed on a computer's memory bank. The distinction was worth remembering. There would be major differences between the man and the computer. Pearsa had different senses. Pearsa would never suffer hunger pangs or a frustrated sex urge. Pearsa would never exercise or use the restroom. Pearsa might well have no sense of self-preservation. That was worth finding out. And Pearsa was compelled to follow orders. Pearsa was Corbell's slave. Two weeks passed before Corbell gave in to the urge for conversation. Go Seated in the control on. chair, floating among stars that were already brighter and bluer above than below, Corbell said, Pearsa, you may speak. Good. You've instructed me to guard your life and the ship. I can't maintain one gravity all the way without killing you and wrecking the ship. Don't lie to me, Corbell snapped. I checked it out on the computer before I ever passed Saturn. The ram effect works better at high velocities because I can narrow the width of the ram fields. Greater hydrogen flux. You used data already in the computer. Yes, of course. Corbell, that data was meant for jumps of up to 52 light years not 33,000. We built the field generator as strong as possible, but it will not stand one gravity at your peak velocity. The strains will tear it apart. We'll have to decrease thrust starting three years from now, if you want to live. Pierce the Checker had never lied, had he? Pierce had never bothered. Why lie to a corpsicle? Pierce was something else again. Corbell said, You're lying. I deny it. Make up your mind. You've ordered me not to lie. Am I under your orders? If not, why don't I just turn and head for Van Manen Star? Corbell gave up. This ruins my itinerary, doesn't it? How long will it take us to reach the core? In near perfect safety, about 500 years. Give me, oh, a 90% chance of getting there alive. How long? Computing. Insufficient data on interstellar mass density. We'll correct that on the way. 160 years, 4 months, plus or minus 10 months. All figures in ship's time. Corbell felt cold. That long? Suppose we don't go direct. We could skim above the plane of the galaxy and thin out the interstellar matter. Computing. Good, Corbell. We lose some time thrusting laterally at turnover, but we still shave some time. 136 years, 11 months confidence of a year and a month. That still isn't good. And you'd have to spend the same time coming home. You'd get home dead, Corbell. We could finish your original mission faster than that. Well, for... Never say forget it to a computer. You have your orders. I now amend them. Your mission is to get us to the galactic axis right. in minimum yeah. ship's time relative. 90% right. confidence of getting me there alive. You'll never see Earth again. Shut up. You may speak. Right. Silence. Does it bother you, being cut off like that? Yes, of course it bothers me. I've been silent for a week. That's four weeks added to our trip time. Turn left. The longer it takes me to persuade you, the longer it will take us to complete our mission. I could order you to give up that idea. I would do it. Snarling of my circuits might result. Corbell, I appeal to your sense of gratitude. The state created you. You owe your very existence. Bullshit. Is it that easy for you to ignore your duty? Corbell swallowed an urge to drive his fist through a bank of dials. No, it's not easy. Every time you raise the holy name of the state, something in me snaps to attention. Then why not listen to the voice of your social conscience? Because it's not my conscience. It's those damn shots. You filled me full of memory RNA. 
And that's where my sense of duty to the state is coming from. Pearson took a good dramatic pause before he said, insinuatingly, Suppose it's your conscience after all. I'll never know, will I? And that's your doing, isn't it? So live with it. You will never see Earth again. Your medical facilities will not keep you alive that long. Corbell snorted. Don't be silly. The medicines in the cold sleep tank are supposed to keep me young and healthy for the first two hundred years. The cold sleep tank has a rejuvenating effect, remember? It doesn't. I lied. Go straight on. You were to remain alive for the duration of your mission. If the medicines had been better, we would have extended the mission. It rang true. It fitted well with what Corbell knew of the state. You sons of bitches. Corbell, listen to me. In three hundred years, the state may discover complete rejuvenation. We could arrive home in time for non-citizens. No answer. We're going to the galactic axis. You have your orders. You must enter cold sleep immediately, Pierce said in a dead voice. Oh? Your optimum program is ten years in cold sleep, six months to recover, then cold sleep again. You will survive to see the galactic axis, barely. Uh-huh. And if you happen to forget to wake me up? That's your problem, traitor. Two. Raw throat, cramped muscles, eyes that wouldn't focus. Questing hands found him in a coffin with the lid still on. Waking from cold sleep was like waking from death. He had half expected this when they froze him in 1970, and he had half expected never to wake. He whispered, Here, sir. Here? Where would I go? Yeah. Where are go we? Go straight on. 106 light years from Seoul. You must eat. Suddenly, Corbell was ravenous. He sat up, rested, then climbed down from the tank, treating himself like fragile crystal. He was lean as Get death ready to turn and light. weak. Fix me a snack I can take to the womb room, he said. It will be waiting. He felt lightheaded. No, he felt light. He picked up a large bulb of hot soup in the kitchen and sucked at it as he continued to the womb room. Give me a view, he said. The walls disappeared. The stars blazed violet white over his head. The stellar rainbow spread out from there. Violet stars in the center, then rings of blue, green, yellow, orange, dim red. To the sides and below, there was almost nothing. A dozen dim red points, and the feathery ring of flame that marked his drive. That had dimmed, too, for Pierce had pulled the ram fields close, and had reddened because the fuel guided into that ring was moving at near light speed relative to the ship. Pierce was bitter. Are you satisfied? Even if we turned back now, we have lost over four hundred years of Earth time. You bore me, said Corbell, though he felt stabbing pain from what he would once have called his conscience. Here what happens are. next? Safe and sound. Next? You eat and exercise. In six months, you must be strong and fat. Fat? Fat. Otherwise, you could not survive ten years in cold sleep. Finish your soup, then exercise. What do I do for entertainment? Whatever you like. Naturally, Pearson was puzzled. The state had provided nothing for Corbell's entertainment. Yeah, I thought so. Tell me about yourself, Pearson. We're going to be together a long time. What do you want to know? I want to know how you got to be this way. What was it like to be Pearson the Checker, citizen of the state? Start with your childhood. Pearson was a poor storyteller. He rambled. He had to be led by appropriate questions, but there was more than his voice to tell tales with. He was an inept motion picture director with an unlimited budget. On the wall of the womb room, he showed Corbell the farming community where he had grown up, and the schools of his childhood, skyscrapers with playgrounds on the roof, and the animated history texts he had studied during his final training. The memories were usually hazy. Some were shockingly sharp and brightly colored. The enormous ten-year-old who bullied Pearsa on the exercise roof. The older girl who showed him sex and thus frightened him badly. His civics teacher. Corbell ate and slept and exercised. He tended Don Juan with a half-instinctive love and understanding absorbed with his rammer training. In between, he had from Pearsa all the knowledge he had not dared demand of Pierce the checker. 
he saw views of Cielador, the city he had only glimpsed from a rooftop. Time to hit the, road. the buildings were as blocky and unimaginative inside as out. The carvings at street level were ensuring the state language. They were edifying principles, rules of conduct, or the life stories of state heroes. He grew to know Pirsa as well as he had known Mirabel, his wife for twenty-two years. In knowing Pirsa, he grew to know the state. The computer memory held what Corbell would have called civics texts. He read those with helpful comments from Pirsa. He learned of two brushfire wars that had half destroyed the world. In ashes of war and fires of idealism, the state had been born, said Pirsa, and had rapidly grown all-powerful. It was a benevolent fascism, Pirsa said. What Pirsa described had distinct overtones of Chinese and Japanese empire. Society was drastically stratified. A citizen's obligations to those above him, and below him, were backed with his life. The government built and controlled every power generator. Once these had been very diverse, dams, geothermal plants, temperature okay, differential plants go. in the ocean depths. Now they were big fusion generators supplemented by rooftop and desert solar energy collectors. But the state owned them all. Once he asked, Pirsa, do you know what a water monopoly empire is? No. Pity. A lot of early civilizations were water monopoly empires. Ancient Egypt, ancient China, the Aztecs. Any government that controls irrigation completely is a water empire. If the state controls power of all kinds, they also control the fresh water supply, don't they? With a population of 12 billion. Yes, of course. We built the dams and rerouted the rivers and distilled fresh water for deuterium for the fusion plants and sent the excess water onward. If the state had ever paused to rest, half the world would have died of thirst. Musing, Corbell said, I once asked you if you thought the state would last 50,000 years. I don't. I think the state could last 70 or 100,000. See, these water monopoly empires, they don't collapse. They can rot from within, to the point where a single push from the barbarians outside can topple them. The levels of society lose touch with each other, and when it comes to the crunch, they can't fight. But it takes that push from outside. There's no revolution in a water empire. That's a very strong statement. Yeah. Do you know how the two-province system works? They used it in China. Say there are two provinces, A and B, and they're both having a famine. What you do is, you look at their records. If province A has a record of cheating on its taxes, or rioting, then you confiscate all the grain in province A and ship it to B. If the records are about equal, you pick at random. The result is that province B is loyal forever, and province A is wiped out so you don't worry about it. We rarely have famines. When we do... It was rare for Pearson not to finish the sentence. There's nothing more powerful than controlling everybody's water. A water control empire can grow so feeble that a single barbarian horde can topple it. But, Pearson, the state doesn't have any outside. Much later, Corbell learned that he had changed his life again. At the time, he only suspected, from Pearson's silence, that he had offended Pearson. And Pirsa was not Pierce. The checker ready. was long dead. The computer personality had never harmed Corbell. It was worth remembering. Corbell gave up talking about the Turn state. Right. Pirsa was loyal to the state. Corbell emphatically was not. There was another topic he eventually gave up. Once too often he told Pirsa, I still wish you'd sent a woman with me. Must I remind you that the life support system is too small for two? Or that soul is now a vast distance behind us? Or that your sex urge tested low? If it had not, you would not be here. Ready to turn left. It was a matter of privacy, Corbell said between his teeth. But the loving bunks in the dormitory were not the only test. In word association, you tested low. Your testosterone level tested low. You ballless wonder. How can you talk to me about low sex urge? The state has a superfluity of testicles. Pierce said with no particular emphasis. Would Pierce the Checker have reacted that way? It was a weird Finding response, a but Pierce meant it. Corbell stopped talking about women. Okay. Six months Let's passed. Find a new Stars route. passed, too. A few passed close enough to show like violet windows into hell and receded like dim red fireballs. Corbell was fat, too fat for his own tastes, fat enough for Pierce's, when at last he climbed into the great coffin. 
It happened seven times. 3. Corbel, is something wrong? Speak, please. Corbel sighed in the cold sleep tank. He did not move. He had become very used to this routine, the terrible weakness, the hunger, the six months of exercises and of forcing insipid food down his throat, the climbing into the tank to start the cycle over. At this, his seventh awakening, he felt a deadly right. reluctance to wake up. Turn right. Corbel, please say something. I can sense your heartbeat and respiration, but I can't see you. Have you turned catatonic? Shall I administer shock? Don't administer shock. Can you move, or are you too weak? He sat up. It made him dizzy. Ship's thrust was very low. Where are we? Beyond midpoint of our course, thrusting laterally to force us back into the plane of the galaxy, proceeding according to plan, your plan, not mine. Now I want to monitor your health. Later, make me soup. I'll take it to the womb room. He moved toward the kitchen, bouncing oddly in the low gravity. He had aged more than the four years he had been awake. After each awakening, the exercises had taken longer to build him up again. He felt brittle and ravenous. The soup was good. The soup was always good. He settled himself in the womb room and let his eyes roam the dials. Some of the readings were frightening. The gamma ray flux would have charred him in minutes if the power of the ram fields were not guiding the particles aside. Other readings made no sense. Pirsa had told the truth. The Cedar ramship was not designed for velocities this close to the speed of light. Neither were the instruments and dials. And what about Pierce's senses? Was he flying half-blind? Give me a full view, he said. The stellar rainbow had hardened and sharpened over seven decades. It had lost symmetry, too. To one side, the stars Straight were thickly on. clustered. The arc of blue whites blazed like diamonds in an empress's necklace. To the other, the side that faced intergalactic space, the rainbow was almost dark. Each star was sharply defined within its band of color. But within the central disk of violet stars, dimmer than the blue, but of a color that made one squint, was a soft white glow, the microwave background of the universe, at three degrees absolute, boosted to visible light by Don Juan's terrible speed. His ship's drive flame had become a blood-red fan of light facing intergalactic space. Pirsa was thrusting laterally to bend their course back into the plane of the galaxy. Give me a corrected view, Corbell instructed. Now Pirsa worked a kind of fiction. From the universe he perceived through the senses on Don Juan's hull, he extrapolated a picture of the universe seen at rest, and he painted that picture around the wall of the womb room. The galaxy was incomparably Go beautiful. Straight on. A whirlpool of light spread out across half the universe. Corbell looked ahead of him for his first view of the galactic core. It was there, just brighter than the rest, and hazy, without definition. He was disappointed. He had thought the close-packed ball of stars would flame with colors. He could pick out no individual stars, only a vague glow around a central bright point. Behind him, the stars were similarly blurred. I'm getting poor definition in the view aft. Pierce volunteered. The light is drastically red-shifted. And forward? This is not according to theory. I would have expected more definition within the core. There must be a great deal of interstellar matter blocking the light. Even so, I need more data. Corbell didn't answer. A multiple star cluster had caught his eye, half a dozen brilliant points whirling frantically as they came toward him. They passed on the right, still jiggling madly and froze in place as they came alongside. The next time that happens, I'd like to see an uncorrected view. I'll call you, but you won't see much. So here he was at the halfway point, with his destination in sight. No man before him could have seen the glow of the galactic core, or the frantically spinning star cluster flashing past at this close to light speed. His enemy's soul had become Corbell's slave. Corbell flies toward the core suns like a moth toward a flame, expecting death. But he has his victories. He finished his anonymous soup. Don Juan's kitchen and or chemistry lab supplied just enough taste, just enough variety, to keep a state non-citizen from cutting his throat. On such fare he must grow fat, and exercise to distribute the fat. Lately it tended to settle in a pot belly, which was no help at all. He was getting old. 
Despite the cold sleep tank and all the medicines available, he would be decrepit before they reached the core suns. His second life should have been more like his first. He had hoped to make friends, to carve out some kind of career. He had been frozen at age 44. There would have been time, time even for a marriage, children. Things would look better when he had built up some strength. He could go on an oxygen drunk. On request, Pearsa would fill the cabin with pure oxygen, while lecturing Corbell on the adverse medical effects for as long as Corbell would let him. About now you usually start telling me my duty, he said. There's no point, said Pearsa. We're decelerating now. We'll be among the Corsons before we can break to a stop. Corbell smiled. Anyone but you would have given up sooner. Expand my view of the Corsons, please. The hub of the galaxy rushed toward him. Dark clouds with stars embedded in them surrounded a bright core. They looked like churning storm clouds. They had changed position since his last waking period. But the core itself was a flat, featureless glow, except for a single bright point at the center. The interstellar matter must be almighty thick in there. Can our ram fields handle it? If we give up thrust and settle for shielding the life support system and nothing else, you'll be amazed at what we can handle. I'll be dying anyway, of old age. Corbell, there is a way you can go home again. Damn it, Persa, have you been lying to me? Calm down, Corbell. There is a way to make you young, if you are willing. You can understand why I didn't raise the subject before. I sure can. Why now? Why would you do this for someone who betrayed your precious state? Things have changed, Corbell. By now, we may be the last remnants of the state, and you weren't even a citizen. And you are? I am a human personality imposed on a computer's memory banks. I could never be a citizen. You could have been. Such as you are, you may well represent the state. The state may not survive the 70,000 years we will be gone. You are worth preserving. Thank you. Unreasonably, Corbell was touched. The state may exist only in your memory. I'm glad you forced me to teach you speech. I'm glad I told you so much about myself. You must live. Make me young, Corbell said, with the fervor of a man growing old much too fast. What does it take? We have the equipment to take a clone from you. You surely find nothing strange about the concept of cloning. We knew about it. Cloning of carrots, anyway. But we can clone men. We can clone you. Let the individual grow in sensory deprivation in your cold sleep tank. We can record your memories and play them into the clone's blank mind. How? Oh, of course, the computer link. The link was a direct telepathic control over the computer. Corbell had never dared use it. He had been doubly afraid of it since the computer became Pierce the Checker. Pierce might use it to take him over. Pierce said, We must also have injections of your memory RNA. Corbell yelped. You're talking about grinding me up into chemically leached hamburger. I'm talking about making a young man of you. It wouldn't be me, you madman. The new individual would be as much Jerome Branch Corbell as you are. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You told me what happened to the real Corbell. Ground up for hamburger and leached for RNA and injected into a brain-wiped criminal. The real Corbell must have been insane or stupid. At 70 degrees and below... The phospholipids in the glia in the brain freeze. The synapses are destroyed. Any educated man knows this, said Pierce. He and the other corpsicles never had a chance. You are an improvement on that, Corbell. I will make the clone an improvement over you. I thought you might. No thanks. There isn't going to be a Corbell Mark III. Six months later, he was not ready for the cold sleep tank. You've been shirking your exercises, Pierce said. Corbell had just finished an exercise period. Tendinitis had led him to favor his arms these past two months, but they hurt anyway. Two hot wires in his shoulders. It's your schedule, he grumbled. I would have to thaw you early. Coming out of cold sleep is a trauma. You want to reach the galactic core in optimum condition. Take another two months awake. Fine. I hate that damn tank anyway. Corbell slumped in a web chair. In near freefall, he was too prone to lose muscle tone. His pot belly protruded. He had nobody else to talk to, and Pierce had endless patience. It should have been good timing when Pierce said, 
Have you given any thought to regaining your youth? Corbell shuddered. Forget it. Hastily, I don't mean that literally. If you wipe it from your memory banks, you'll only think of it again later. I take it you've cancelled your command. What is your objection? It's ugly. As things stand now, you will die of aging on the return voyage. The cold sleep treatment is not enough. I will not be ground up for hamburger. Not again. You know the details of Don Juan's excrement recycling system. Do you find that ugly? Since you ask, yes. But you eat the food and drink the water. Corbell didn't answer. You would be a young man when it was over. No, no, I would not, Corbell was shouting. I would be hamburger, contaminated hamburger, garbage to be recycled for the b benefit of your damn clone. He would even be a good copy, because you'd be shoving some of your own thoughts in through the computer link. You have no loyalty to anything but yourself. Corbell thought, I can shut him up, any time. He said, Whatever it is I am, I'll settle for it. The only man who ever saw the galactic core. A wonderful thing. Pierce had had time and practice to develop that sarcastic Keep tone. Right. And then exit what will you do right. afterward, once your sole ambition in life is satisfied? Will you order me to self-destruct? A grand funeral pyre for your ending? A fusion flame that alien eyes might see? Then Corbell did Pierce an injustice. Go straight on. Is that what's been bothering you? Tell you what, he said. After we have our look around the core suns, why don't we drop some package probes on appropriate planets? You can reach Earth alive. By the time the state sends ships, the algae will have turned some reducing atmospheres to oxygen atmospheres. You can take my mummy home, too, in the cold sleep tank. Maybe they'll want it for a museum. You will not be young again. We've been through that. Very well. Will you go to the womb room, please? I have a great deal to show you. Mystified and suspicious, Corbell went. Pierce had set up displays on the womb room walls. There was a greatly enlarged, slightly blurred view of the galactic core, as Corbell had seen it six months ago. Drastically flattened, the glow of the suns blurred by interstellar matter. There was a contrasting enlargement of the center of the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. There was a diagram an oddly contoured disk cut down the center. Corbell frowned, wondering where he had seen that before. Pierce spoke as he settled himself in the control chair. I have never known why you chose the galactic axis as your destination. I may never understand that. The core of Andromeda Galaxy glowed with colored lights. Corbell pointed. For that, for beauty, for the same reason I once went through the Grand Canyon on muleback. Can you imagine a planet on the edge of that sphere? The nights? I can do better. I can put it before you by extrapolation. And Pierce did. Corbell's chair floated above a dark landscape. The sky was jammed with stars, competing for space, big and little, red and blue and pure white, and a spinning pair that threw out a spiral of red gas. The sky turned. A wall of blackness rose in the east. Ten thousand cubic light years of dust cloud. And then the womb room was as it had been, while Corbell was still gaping. I could have done that before your first term in the cold sleep tank. We could have completed your mission, seeded the worlds assigned to you, and I could have displayed that sky for you at any time. Why didn't you say something? It's not real. Pierce, didn't any of your aristocrats ever go cruising through, say, Saturn's rings, just for the joy of it? For the mining possibilities? Mining. If they said that, they lied. Are you sorry you came? Why had he kept on, knowing that the trip would take more than twenty-one years, that it would take his life, had not changed his mind? Corbell, the reconstituted corpsicle, would never carve out a normal life for himself. Very well, he would do something memorable. No, why should I be sorry? I expected strangeness in the galactic core. I was right, wasn't I? It's nothing like other galaxies, and I'm the first to know it. You're insane. Imagine my amazement. Never mind. Your choice has had unforeseen consequences. State astronomers expected a close-packed sphere of millions of suns, averaging a quarter to half a light year apart, with red giant suns predominating. Instead, we find this. 
the matter in the core forced into a disk that flattens drastically toward the center, with a tremendously powerful source of infrared and radio energy at the axis. Like your diagram? Yes, very like this diagram, which I find in my databanks, a representation of the structure of the accretion disk around the black hole in Cygnus X1. Oh, he had not seen that diagram during his rammer training. His rammer training had not even told him how to avoid stellar-sized black holes, because there were none to be expected on his planned course. He had seen something very like that diagram in an article in Scientific American. Yes, Corbell, your wonderland of lights is being absorbed by a black hole of galactic mass. Its spin must be enormous from the way it has flattened the mass of stars around it. Eventually, the entire galaxy may disappear into... Corbell, are you ill? No, Corbell said, his hands covering his face, muffling his voice. Don't be depressed. This is our chance for life. What? A thin chance to see Earth again before you die. A unique experience, win or lose. Isn't that what you want? Let me explain. 4. At the thirteenth awakening, he tried to sit up too fast. He woke again, dizzy, flat on his back in the coffin, with Piercer calling in his ear. Corbel! Corbel! Here. Where would I go? Be more careful. Lie there for a minute. Lean as death he was, and old. Arthritis grated in his knobby joints. With the familiar hunger came nausea. He ran a hand over his scalp. He had been half bald when he entered Forest Lawn, and more of his hair came away. Where are we? One month from the black hole and closing. The view will please you. He emerged from the cold sleep tank like a sick Dracula. He made his limping way to the kitchen, then to the health club. His muscles were slack and tended to cramp. Ready to turn the exercises were hard on him, but the pain and the nausea and the creeping years meant little. He felt good. At worst, he had found a brand new way to die. He asked of the ubiquitous microphones, Suppose we go too far in. We won't ever die, will we? We'd be stopped above the Swisschild radius. Only to an outside observer, not to ourselves. Are you about to change my orders? No. Some minutes later, he eased himself into the womb room chair. He sipped the last of the broth. Full view. Don Juan raced above a sea of churning stars. In a normal galaxy, they would have been crowded enough. Here, forced into a plane by the spin of the giant black hole at the center, they were crowded to death. Dying stars burned with a terrible light. They stood like torches in a field of candles. It must be common enough for star to ram star here, or for tides to rip stars apart. Commoner toward the center, Corbell thought. The center of the sea burned very bright ahead of him. He could see no dark dot at the axis. He hadn't expected to. How far away are we in normal space? Rest space? 3.6 light years. No problems? I believe I can hold us above the plane of the disk until we have passed that very active swelling ahead of us between two and three light years from the singularity. Corbell looked down at his drive flame a dim wisp of white between his feet. There was very little matter above the disk, he guessed. Suppose you can't. Suppose we have to go through it. You'll never feel a thing. That region is where the stars lose their identity. They become streamers of dense plasma with nodules of neutronium in them. Most of the light comes from there. Beyond, there is very great flattening and some radiation due to friction in the matter spiraling inward. What about the black hole itself? I still don't have a view of it. I estimate a circumference of two billion kilometers and a mass of one hundred million solar masses. The ergosphere will be large. We should have no trouble choosing a path through it. You said circumference? Should I have given you the radius? The radius of a black hole may be infinite. There was simply no grasping the size of that disk of crushed stars. It was like flying above another universe. At two billion kilometers, the black hole would almost have contained the orbit of Jupiter. But if Corbell could have seen past that swelling ahead, that ring of fire, he would have found the black hole invisibly small. 
Light caught the corner of his eye, and he turned to see a supernova glaring white on red. He'd just missed seeing a sun torn apart by tides, its ten million degree heart spilled across the sky. He asked what he had never asked before. Pirsa, what are you thinking? I don't quite know how to answer that. Try. I'm not thinking anything. My decisions are made. They are mathematically rigorous. I face no choices. How are you going to find Earth? I know where Sol will be in three million years. Three? Won't it be more like seventy thousand? We're driving deep into a tremendous gravity field. Time will be compressed for us. The black hole is large enough that tides will not tear us apart, but we'll lose almost three million years before I fire the fusion motor. What more can I do? The odds are finite that we will find Sol, or the state may have spread through a million cubic light years of space before we arrive. The odds are finite. Pirsa, you're strange. Pirsa, you're strange. But Corbell felt no urge to laugh. Seventy thousand years B.C., there had been Neanderthal man and a few Cro-Magnon, humans. Three million years ago, nothing but a club-swinging, meat-eating ape. What would inhabit the Earth three million years from now? Corbell spent most of his time in the womb room, watching the accretion disk swirl past. He liked the uncorrected view, the display that showed the universe distorted by Don Juan's velocity. Get ready Since turnover, the ship had shed most of its enormous relativistic mass. Don Juan had been moving faster after Corbell's first term in the cold sleep tank. But it was still traveling near light speed and accelerating steadily under the pull of a point source 100 million times the mass of the sun. The accretion disk showed rainbow colored ahead of him, with the ring of fire, a violet white hill, coming near. The stars were jammed together. You couldn't tell one from the next unless the next had exploded. They graded back through the rainbow until the sea of flame behind Don Juan was deep red and frozen in place with the occasional supernova showing yellow-white or greenish-white. The ring of fire, the swollen region where the heat trapped within the streaming star stuff grew even more powerful than the black hole's compression effect, came near. It was blinding bright before Corbell gave up. Reduce that light, he said, half covering his eyes. I've cut it to ten percent. Let me know when I must cut it again. Are you all right? Will it burn out your cameras? I think not. Remember, you were to dive almost into Seoul to decelerate at the end of your mission. We can handle high intensities of light. The ring of fire was a flattened donut, twenty light years in circumference, a quarter of a light year thick, four or five cubic light years of green to blue white star, with every possible grade of fusion and fission going on in it, as if hell were a tremendous mountain coming near, and Don Juan crossed it on a fan of fusion flame thrusting hard. Corbell felt the thrust drop away. He sat forward as the ship dropped along the inner gradient and left the ring of fire behind, a dull red wall. The inner accretion disk was drastically thinner, savagely compressed. Corbell peered toward where the black hole ought to be. All he saw was more star matter, hurtingly violet-white at the center. It was all happening terribly fast now, minutes left or seconds. Pirsa was firing the attitude jets at strange angles. There were no stars to see in this inner disk, no detail at all. It was as uniform as peanut butter. It's all neutronium, said Pirsa. It even has some of neutronium's crystalline structure, but that structure is constantly breaking up. I can see the X-ray flashes, like ripples. I wish I had some of your senses. The computer link? No. Behind them, the ring of fire reddened further and was gone. The inner disk grew brighter and bluer and was suddenly passed. In the last instant, Corbell saw the black hole. The onboard fusion drive roared beneath him, slammed him down into his chair. Light exploded in his face. Right. It resolved. A blaze of violet light ahead of him, a broad ring of embers around it. Elsewhere, black. Pierce said, there is something we must discuss. Turn right. Wait a minute. Give me a chance to resume breathing. Pierce waited. Corbell said, It's over? We lived through that? Yes. Well done. Thank you. 
What's happening now? Firing a reaction drive within the ergosphere of a black hole has driven us dangerously near light speed. I am using the ram fields to ward interstellar matter from us. I won't be able to use them as a drive until we can shed some velocity. We will reach the vicinity of Sol in 13.8 years, ship's time, unless we overshoot. Did we really lose three million years? Yes. Corbell, I must have your opinion. Will the state have collapsed over three million years? Corbell laughed a little shakily. We'll be lucky if there's anything like human beings left. I can't guess what they'll be like. Three million years. I wish there'd been another way to do it. He stood up. He was suddenly ravenous. Pierce answered, I was ordered to preserve your life and the integrity of the ship, but never your convenience. My loyalty is to the state. Corbell stopped. What's that supposed to mean? There was another way to use the black hole, once we knew it existed. At midpoint, we could have continued to accelerate. We would have spent perhaps 80 years reaching the galactic hub. If we passed near enough to the black hole, its spin would have bent our hyperbolic path back upon itself, though we would still have been well outside the ergosphere. Another 80 years of ship's time would have returned us to Seoul, 70,000 years after your departure. You thought of that, and you didn't do it? Corbell, I have no data on the nature of water monopoly empires. I had to take your word entirely. What are you talking about? His answer came in Corbell's recorded voice. I think the state could last seventy or a hundred thousand. See, these water monopoly empires, they don't collapse. They can rot from within, to the point where a single push from the barbarians outside can topple them. The levels of society lose touch with each other, and when it comes to the crunch, they can't fight but it takes that push from outside. There's no revolution in a water empire. Corbell said, I don't... A water empire can grow so feeble that a single barbarian horde can topple it. But, Pirsa, the state doesn't have any outside. I don't understand. The state could last 70 or 100,000 years because all of humanity was part of the state. There were no barbarians waiting hungrily for the state to show weakness. The state could have grown feeble beyond any precedent, feeble enough to fall before the hatred of a single barbarian. You, Corbell. You. Me? Did you exaggerate the situation? I thought of that, but I couldn't risk it, and I couldn't ask. He's a computer. Perfect memory. Rigid logic. No judgment. I forgot. I talked to him like a human being. And now... You have heroically saved the state from me. I'll be damned. Was the danger unreal? I couldn't ask. You might have lied. I never wanted to overthrow the damned government. All I wanted was a normal life. I was only 44 years old. I didn't want to die. You never could have had what you called a normal life. It was already impossible in 2190 Anno Domini. I guess not. I just didn't, didn't see it. Let's go home.